Welcome, welcome to tonight's Wu University webinar, Remiotics You Should Know About. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Stewart, <laughs> and I'm very, very honored tonight to have Dr. Jason Ng here with me. Thank you to Lens Therapeutics for exhibiting at tonight's event. So it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jason Ng. He's currently a tenured professor at the Southern California College of Optometry at Marshall B. Ketchum University and a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry. He received his Doctor of Optometry degree from Southern California College of Optometry after completing his BA degree at UC Berkeley in cell biology. He spent several years in private practice and completed a PhD in vision science at the UC Berkeley School of Optometry before returning to SCCO. His research and clinical interests are in the areas of visual acuity, color vision, and presbyopia. He's authored many scientific papers and has presented his research at national and international vision conferences. Welcome, Dr. A. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for spending uh, time with us on, on your Monday night. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. And uh, just thank you for coming. Uh, it's it's really an honor to be part of uh, Wu University. Uh, Dr. Wu was uh, one of my students, as she reminded me. And uh, out of about 100 uh, sort of scientific posters that we've done, I've done, uh, I've had about only two in dry eye. And Stephanie Wu was one of them. So <laughs> I remember she chose me as her uh, little research project advisor. So that was an honor as well. So this comes full circle. It's very, very nice. So I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Stewart, for that introduction. Uh, this is sort of the middle of a three-part series in the presbyopia sort of talks, and Dr. Kidding um, kicked it off uh, earlier in the later last month, um, looking at the general management strategies um, and uh, mostly looking at IOLs and, and topicals. And we'll talk more in depth about topicals today. So here's the outline, cover some sort of basics to get us all on the same schedule or stage, uh, talk a little bit about the general two mechanisms that they've been trying to work out for presbyopic drops, and then specifically get into the three myotics, pilocarpine, remicol, and acyclidine. And then we're going to compare the three head-to-head -head on mechanisms, pupil uh, sort of size or reaction, and then and ciliary muscle stimulation, and then lastly, the side effect profiles. So here are the learning objectives. And just to start off, we just want to quickly review sort of prevalence and basics of presbyopia. Right, presbyopia, huge prevalence, right? 40% in the US and it's continuing to increase throughout through the end of the decade, which I would imagine is going to continue to increase, but at least based on this data, it's going to plateau. But still, millions and millions of people that are looking for, you know, they're going to need solutions and already doing a lot of it. So just to review, I know you all understand presbyopia quite well. Um, just as a reminder, right, the lens sort of thickens with age. It gets more rigid. Um, this contributes to the loss of accommodation, right? Part of the stiffening comes from sort of protein cross-linking, um, which one of the mechanisms by the lens softeners is trying to sort of defeat. Um, so we'll talk just briefly about that. And then, of course, uh, the myotics are going to try to solve this problem in a different way. Um, and as Dr. Kidding said last time, you know, presbyopia is kind of on a spectrum um, with the lens changes, right, heading towards cataract. And, you know, they're starting to call that now dysfunctional lens syndrome, um, which is a really good way to think about it. It's just, you know, presbyopia is part of a process that is getting worse and worse, right? So we are going to be able to intervene at multiple stages of that process. So this graphic, right, shows the mechanism of accommodation, right? You, again, know this, but just as a review and relating to some of the side effects we'll talk about, right? As the ciliary body contracts, you sort of loosen the zonular tension, right? The lens is able to increase its curvature, right? Increase the focal power to see near targets. And all the myotics we'll talk about today stimulate the ciliary muscle as well as iris sphincter. Ideally, we would only stimulate the iris sphincter because that's all we need for meiosis. Um, but we end up stimulating the ciliary body too, although to a different degree, as we'll look at at the end of this talk. And, you know, that ciliary muscle contraction, of course, is what contributes to sort of the brow ache or the headache side effect um, that we're getting. And then the other thing, you know, we'd point out is sort of as, as this lens is moving forward, right, and the ciliary body is moving, it's making space, right, for the vitreous body to move forward. And that can then in turn create traction on the back of the retina, as we've, you know, heard about 
Um, and we'll talk about that as a, as a definite safety issue. So before we get to myotics, just want to talk about, you know, treating presbyopia very generally. We all know the various ways to, to treat it with contacts and glasses. And then again, Dr. Kidding um, got into, you know, the really good IOL options that, that continuously improve. And so now we want to dive into the myotics. Beyond that, though, of course, we have patients all the time that are continuing to buy over-the-counter readers like the picture here. And, and, you know, I will buy them too sometimes just to use in lab. Um, you know, they have like 10 pairs of these all around the house or in their car and at their office. And just like some people have said, these are, you know, one fit, one, one, one size fits in absolutely nobody and makes things worse possibly. So <laughs> definitely people are looking for options. One of the things that's been tried and uh, we'll look at it really quick is lens softeners. So these are, you know, drops, chemicals that are going to sort of try to break the, the sulfide bonds and the cross-linking that's happening in the lens to try to sort of essentially reverse the aging process of the lens. And then, of course, myotics are making the pupil smaller, which allow us to increase the depth of field or depth of focus. So we'll look at that. But right away, let's just look at lens softeners really quick. Um, really short because the future is not very clear with them right now, unfortunately. So there's sort of two agents that have been looked at. Oxysterols were, was one of them. This study looked at it in uh, humans as well as uh, rodent or mouse lenses, um, and it didn't work, unfortunately. And then this one, the, the, the lace uh, chemical, the lipoic acid cholinester eye drops, um, if you look, you know, they did improve near acuity, but not by much, right? So you have a logmar of minus 0.16 versus a logmar of minus 0.08, which is less than a line, right? So that's four letters of improvement. So not impressive. And that's why this drop didn't make it out of uh, phase two trials. And so it's, no one's really looking at this anymore, unfortunately. Uh, Novartis had bought the rights to this, to this drug and uh, tried to push it as far as they can. But right now, uh, the future is uncertain, but hopefully, hopefully somebody will be able to, to look at this and uh, somehow improve it because this would be a true cure. If we were to essentially reverse the process, we could sort of, you know, not get cataracts as much and as well as, you know, not have presbyopia as much. One small thing to look at, you know, just underline here is that any improvement they did see actually was sustained. So it's kind of like you got semi-permanent, you know, again, reversal of the aging process and lens. So that's super exciting um, if this can move forward. But again, right now, nothing's happening anymore, unfortunately, just based on the, the poor efficacy. You're not getting enough improvement in near VA. And so moving on to what you came for, right? We're going to talk about the myotics, but we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of how they work, just the theory behind that. They, again, are going to, you know, make the pupil smaller to give you better near vision. And this again is more of a treatment, you know, as a, as a management option, definitely not a cure. One interesting thing about um, the idea though, of, of seeing through, a, you know, a myotic pupil versus just an ad, um, you know, just last week I was seeing a patient, I was doing, you know, prescribing their ad and I was, it was a pretty high ad, like 275. And, you know, I was building it up and, and they were telling me, I, well, I was asking them, do you see the bottom line now, right? And they're like, yeah, I see it, but I don't like it. I'm like, why? So it was clear to them, but they didn't like the magnification. Like they felt like it was unnatural. Like they didn't want their ad to go higher. So that was an interesting observation. I haven't really heard that before. And so it was kind of like, yeah, you, you want a more natural appearing near vision that, you know, a, a myotic is kind of perfect for that in a sense. Although that ad, it was so high, I wasn't going to try to do that. But um, that was an interesting observation. I hadn't really thought in my mind, like, seeing up close, you know, with magnification versus just a myotic, uh, why is there a difference? Because you see clearly, but they were bothered by the magnification itself. So it's just kind of an interesting observation. So a little bit of theory, right? There's sort of three ways we can actually improve our, our depth of field or depth of focus. So one is to actually change uh, the, the working distance, right? Move things further back. This is what our patients are already doing. Their arms are getting shorter. And then number two is changing the focal length, right? So that's what we are we're, lens is naturally doing with accommodation. It's getting more curved, getting more plus power. So both of those things the patients, you know, are already doing before they sort of uh, let us try to intervene and help them. <laughs> and so 
uh, changing the aperture size is really what topicals now are, are you know, going after, making the pupil smaller. So just a tiny bit of optics. Uh, on the top part, right, you can see with a large aperture, you've got, you know, really peripheral rays. And those more peripheral rays essentially, you know, really off axis. And so you're going to get more spherical aberration, more higher, higher order aberrations. And so when we make the aperture smaller, right, the pupil smaller, we cut those out. And so we're going to get a smaller blur circle and also a smaller sort of interval um, of, of uh, the circle of least confusion if we have one, right? And so that essentially is improving our depth of focus. Um, and just, you know, technical semantics. Technically, depth of focus is on this side. Depth of field is on this side. Uh, a lot of us, we just use it interchangeably. But yes, they are technically different. But doesn't really make a difference when we're talking to uh, to patients. So talking about, you know, the pupil a little bit more, you know, is there sort of an ideal pupil size to get the job done in terms of reading vision? So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that because that's really a, a difference between the, the three meiotics and, and the pupil sizes that we're getting. So we want to look at that in pretty good detail. So first, you know, let's remember our pupils, they, they naturally change in size, right, with light level. Right. And more light always gives better vision function, right? More light level, we have better color vision, better visual acuity, better contrast sensitivity. So more light is already helping. More light, of course, also makes the pupil smaller, which naturally already increases our depth of field. And so more light, just remember, is always a win-win, right? Light is your friend. That's what uh, Tom Quinn says, right? With, with multifocal contacts, right? More light is always better. And same thing with myotics, right? Myotics, in a sense, um, are helping even beyond that amount of light. And so the same ways that light can help, the myotics can help too. A couple of technical things I wanted to show you, just to highlight uh, two log units on the x-axis here, that's about 100 candelas per meter squared, right? Which is about the luminance of your eye charts that you're using in your clinic. And so the pupil size there is around three millimeters, okay? Our photopic, what we call a photopic daytime level, about three millimeters. Then if you look at a zero log luminance, that is closer to the mesopic light level. And that's important because the FDA trials on these myotics are sort of using the mesopic light level as sort of the primary outcome measure. And you can see there's a big, there's a, you know, there's a decent confidence interval range there, but it's somewhere in the four to five millimeter range when you get down to, you know, lower mesopic light levels. And so uh, I just want to point that out because when we start looking at the data and we talk about, hey, what what were the pupils before and after, you know, it's important to understand the the lower light levels we're doing the trials in and then the photopic or daytime levels. We are doing some of the trial data in, but, you know, that's really, to me, more important in terms of um, daytime regular vision with these drops. And then here's a study, right? This study was actually focused looking at um, pupil size and success in multifocal contacts. So I'm not using it for that. Um, but what it does show you is that, you know, with age, so here you have the pre biopes 18 to 39, here you have the early 40 to 54, and then what they call the established presbyopes. And you can see, yeah, for sure, their pupils get smaller with age. Okay, we know that already. However, if you look, this is a mesopic light level again, just like on the previous graph, like that zero line. And then here is your photopic level, your daytime level. And kind of the take home point is light, you know, light itself makes a much bigger difference in the pupil size than just aging. OK, so light is still like your best option, especially in early presbyopia. More light solves everything. Right. If, if you can. Now, of course, people don't want to pull out their flashlights in the dark restaurants and things like other speakers have said. Um, but more light is always better if you can, if you can. And so always recommend that to your patients. And then, of course, aging. It's trying to naturally get smaller to improve our depth of focus. Just we were evolved that way, perhaps. Um, but now the myotics are going to help help with getting even smaller to help us. So we want to look at ideal pupil, si pupil size now. So let's talk about sort of optimal pupil size. So if you look on the left side, <clears throat> this is data that was redrawn from the Gemini 1 study. Uh, and you can see the viewity drop kind of maxes out at about two millimeters and then it starts you know going up pretty quickly after it, it reaches its minimum and uh this is an article that was written by uh actually my undergraduate research advisor at, at berkeley so i just kind of wanted to show this kind of uh good honor to him too but 
more because it's, it makes a pretty cool point. If you look at these graphs, which I know very scary, you know, the horrors of optometry school and, and optics and stuff. Um, but don't worry about that stuff. The main thing, take home point on these is to look at the dip, right? The valley. The deeper the dip, the deeper the valley goes, the better your retinal contrast. Okay. And so if you look at a three millimeter, millimeter pupil versus a two millimeter pupil at distance, the difference, if you look at the difference between the two dips, it's very really small, really small. So really at a distance vision, right, the two versus three doesn't really matter. But if you look at 66, right, an intermediate, then now look, two millimeter makes a bigger difference. You've got more retinal contrast there. And then you go to our standard near distance of 40 centimeters, two millimeter, two millimeter pupil, even more retinal contrast. So smaller pupils not only give you a bigger depth of focus, right, they also actually improve retinal contrast. So it's actually two things that are getting better. Uh, which a lot of people, I think, we don't realize it's not just depth of focus. So things are actually going to get sharper too. All right. So point, um, the closer the task, right, the smaller the pupil you need. And, and naturally we have that, right, with accommodation and that stuff we've learned, the pupils will also get smaller. But as we lose that, that, that uh, reflex sort of still kicks in, but not as well. And then the closer, you know, things are, the smaller the pupil is an advantage. And so that sort of two to three millimeter thing at distance, that's kind of what we teach classically in optometry school, right? Ideal pupil size, we talked about in optometry school, two to three millimeters, but we're always talking about distance at that time, right? We're never talking about near. And I sort of use this picture, the figure on the left for the optometry students when I'm teaching this. Uh, and if we look at, you know, this sort of line spread function, again, don't get scared by the technicalities, um, this is diffraction, right? So if your pupil is really big, your diffraction limitation is really little you're, and you have really sharp focus. However, with larger pupils, you know you get aberrations. And so in reality, the line spread function is not good. You don't have good retinal contrast, right? And then when you go to a smaller pupil size, like a, a 1.5, you know, at distance, it's a little too small. And so the line spread function, it kind of gets a little bit wider. Your retinal contrast, not quite as good. And so again, at distance, two to three makes sense. But now when we talk about near, we actually need to be below that. So if you look, this is an editorial from uh, Neil Charman that came out and does really good. It's, it's really good read. It does a really good re, uh, review of history and pinholes throughout history and everything that's sort of been tried. But what I wanted to highlight is one figure from the paper. Uh, I'll just draw in a couple other pupil diameters. So there's a three millimeter pupil. There's a 1.5 and there's a one. And so the idea is, you know, if we start at a three millimeter pupil, because remember our photopic light level, daytime level, we were around three, and we go down to two, which is kind of what viewity is hitting, sort of the gain on the depth of focus, you know, it, to th there it looks like, uh, I don't know, a quarter to a half a doctor, which obviously, you know, if you've tried viewity, you know, you get more than that, but this, this is just, you know, we'll think in relative terms. Okay, so the point is, it's not that much. If we can go a little smaller, right, if we look at the 1.5 millimeter pupil line, just that half millimeter difference actually makes a really big difference in your depth of focus. And so it definitely can improve your, your near vision if we can get even a little bit smaller than two. And then beyond that, you know, if you go below one, it, it's definitely a problem because your pupil gets so small that we're blocking off a lot of light. And then your balance between sort of depth of focus and light level is thrown off. You don't, you just don't have enough light to do well. So then, you know, we also realized that th this whole idea of pinholes and stuff, right? The small aperture optics that uh, is not a new idea, right? The inlays, the camera inlay and that Thera IOL that Dr. Kenning talked about last time. Um, they obviously had to think about what the aperture size should be like really seriously, because you're going to implant this into people. So that's, uh, really serious versus using a myotic. So it's always good to sort of look at, you know, what were they thinking? What did they come up with? So the camera inlay, you know, it's, it's in the stromal bed, right, of the cornea. So 1.6 millimeter aperture. And then the Aptera IOL, you know, both of these are from AccuFocus that was now acquired by uh, Bausch and Lomb in January, I think it was. And, you know, the IOL, of course, sits closer to the, the pupil plane, closer to the entrance pupil of the eye. And so, the, the diameter they're coming up with is in about 1.4. But the general idea is anything 
you know, corneal to, to right at the pupil margins around 1.4 to 1.6 is kind of what they found as the magic number. So that makes a lot of sense that a meiotic probably should be in that range, sort of based on all the research that's been done already for that. So let's see. So the actual drops, right? So we'll start with what you know, right? The pilocarpine, and there's actually multiple sort of uh, pilocarpine containing drugs coming out. But the one you know of already is, of course, Vuity, right? FDA approved sort of first in class almost two years now uh, that it's been out. It is uh, preserved with BAK, which uh, we'll talk tonight. A lot of them are, are going to be preservative free now, which is great, right? Because we know BAK disrupts the ocular surface. And if you're using it chronically, if, you know, for presbyopia, which you probably want to, um, then that's going to be a problem. And then what I wanted to review a little bit was, you know, the FDA endpoint, like I, I kind of mentioned before, the FDA endpoint is interesting. It's, it's complex, right? You've heard about it before, but, it, you know, the distance corrected. So we give you your best distance Rx, and then we measure your near acuity with that best distance Rx. And they're, again, using mesopic light levels, right? And, you know, they use mesopic light levels to evaluate IOLs and, and things like that. And so it, they decided to do that for these types of drops too. Um, I mean, I personally, as a as a as a fighting against presbyopia person, I I want to know you know how my vision's going to be at photopic or daytime levels. I don't really hang out most of the time in mesopic levels, so so you know I definitely want to see photopic data as well, which the companies do provide sometimes. So I wanted to look at this endpoint data again. So. If you look, the top of this chart as an as a example, right, is 2200. And the FDA is saying, hey, three or more lines is what we want to see, OK? This is a distance chart, but we're just using it as a near example, right? So three lines is a is a doubling. So you go from 200, right, to 160 to, to 125 to 100. So a three-line improvement, right, is it sort of doing two times better. And that has been used forever, right? Even in the diabetic retinopathy trials back in the late 70s, all the AMD trials, it's a very common FDA visual acuity endpoint. But what's kind of new, of course, is the worsening of distance acuity. So you can't have you know, more than a, dis a line worse of distance acuity um, using the meiotic, right? And the reason they would worry about that, of course, is with the pupil size getting smaller and light going down um, to the eye, then we may lose a little bit of vision function. And so that's an important thing to look at. And so that endpoint, you know, it's fair. The second thing they sometimes look at is, well, instead of three or more lines, how about two or more lines? So two or more lines, if you do the math, comes out to about 60% improvement. And then one line would be, as I said over here, about 26% uh, if you only did one line, which wouldn't be enough to get through. So that's an endpoint, two or more lines. And then the other endpoint that you'll sometimes see is a 2040 endpoint, right? Which a lot of people say, hey, functional vision, that makes sense. Um, my only issue with it is if you look at some of the trial data, <laughs> some of these patients are coming in 2050 baseline. So then they're gonna hit that endpoint pretty easily, the 2040 endpoint. And so you kind of wanna look at that closely and say, hey, is this really making that big a difference? It depends on where you start from, right? So a lot of that, it, it kind of, all this, this chart kind of reminds us, hey, patient selection is kind of important, right? If we want someone to be sort of impressed by the drops, we don't we don't want to have 2200 near acuity, get them to 2100 and, and they're still not impressed, right? So patient selection typically, I would say, you know, 2060 to 2100 is, is probably where you want to be. Um, but of course it varies, you know, some patients, they don't need to see really close, you know, they have big computer screens and can make things bigger. So a three-line improvement, even from 2150, you know, they may be quite happy. So it really just depends, of course, on your patient's demands and what they really want it for. But, you know, without knowing an individual patient's needs, you know, I would say that 2060 to 2100 is probably where you would want to start thinking in terms of um, patient selection. And I think as the new myotics, you know, come out and maybe get better, you know, we can expand that range of, of patient selection based on acuity. And so that's going to be really exciting if we can do that. Okay, so here's the Vuity data uh, from the package insert. So this is Gemini 2 um, data. And, you know, Vuity definitely works, right? If you look, the the placebo group about uh, right there, maybe, I don't know, 15, no, 14, 
13%, whatever. <laughs> and then the treatment group, you know, close to 40%, but that's at one hour, right? The FDA is using the, the sort of three hour time point right here. And there you're looking at placebo 11% and treatment group 26%. So you kind of think about it as like a two times difference between the two groups. Okay. And then at six hours, it's, it's, they're kind the, the curves are converging, right? And, you know, when I'm talking to my graduate students and we're, you know, we're talking about research and methods and stuff, you know, one thing we, we look at these graphs and we always ask, you know, where's, where's the error bars, right? Where's the variability? Um, because if you, you know, these, if you look at the error bars, they could be completely overlapping. And so I'm sure, you know, you've seen a lot of patients at this point that where the drop doesn't last anywhere near six hours, right? And that's where uh, people are putting in earlier, or, you know, that's where the, the VUD data tried to get, uh, you know, BID approval, which they got. Um, but, you know, even here, we don't know, we don't know what the, uh, the confidence intervals are necessarily. And so some, you know, some people are not necessarily super impressed by that necessarily. So let's, if you look at um, the 2040 endpoint, like I said, the secondary outcome measure, uh, again, you know, the placebo group, even they hit that endpoint really high, you know, in high amounts. And so when you start to talk about, you know, 90% in the treatment group got 2040 and 78% in the uh, placebo got, you know, 2040, you know, that difference is, is it's much smaller. So for me, at least as I'm evaluating and thinking about how effective the drops are, I continue to, you know, really use the primary endpoint, which is the three line improvement. Um, I don't really personally uh, look at the 2040 endpoint quite as much um, because it's just, it just depends on what the baseline is, right? And so right here, when I looked at the studies, I found about 50% of patients were pretty close to 2040 at baseline. So, you know, so that data tells me, you know, I really want to stick with the primary endpoint when I'm thinking about evaluating um, the outcomes. So obviously, beauty has done pretty well. Like a lot of prescriptions have been filled, and a lot of patients ha have taken it. Um, and beauty got you know BID approval uh, after the Virgo trial. So we'll look at the data on that in a little bit. And in that study, of course, they 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 took the second drop at six hours, um, but it's approved you know for anywhere put the second drop in anytime after three hours. Uh, and if you look at their data in the Virgo, it's pretty it's a little bit better actually. You know, eight percent versus thirty five percent. So you're looking at kind of a three times um, uh, better efficacy or, or better outcome measure. So in that sense, uh, that trial looked a little better. And I forgot my arrow. So if you look at the Virgo data, um, this is actually sort of the raw data graph and really confusing type of graph, right? It's hard to interpret all this. So I try to kind of, you know, the data is split out by here, right? This is distance acuity. So distance acuity, if you are, you know, getting to the right of this line, you've got better distance acuity with the drop. If you are to the left of this line, you know, the drop made your distance acuity worse. And then you look at this line, this is for near acuity. So on this one, if you're below the line, you got worse near acuity. If you're above the line, you got better near acuity. And so you kind of just draw the lines. So this one is Again, a three line improvement, three lines would be 15 letters. So you'd have to be above this line to hit the outcome measure of getting three lines better. And then you would have to be to the left of this line, meaning a line worse. So a line is five letters, right? So you'd have to be to the left of this line to uh, you know, not get the outcome measure. And so I kind of draw a box around those that actually hit the outcome measure. And so you can see, you know, it definitely works. There's definitely a, gr a treatment group where it definitely worked, but there's also a very large group of overlap, right? Where controls and treatment uh, eyes kind of had the same same thing, right? They kind of got better near, not worse distance, but it kind of is. It kind of to me, it's like wow, it's a really strong placebo effect. So I suppose you could try that too, right? <laughs> Just for fun, you could try the placebo effect. Tell patients, you know. These artificial tears will actually help too, because uh, they, they might if, if your eyes dry or something. So it's something to think about. So in terms of beauty, right? How's it going, right? We know we know the the rollout was a little a little rough. Um, my understanding was right, the approval came a little before the company expected, and uh, the, the the marketing guys just you know went went crazy on that, and not everyone was really ready about what was about to happen there. Um, but 
they definitely, you know, have spent a lot on it and uh, we have definitely been able to use it for patients. But, you know, there are some lessons to be learned, I suppose, in, in kind of how it came out and how we're doing things, because we've we've learned as we want, as we've gone, how to adjust things and how to how to make it a little smoother. And so I think if you look at this is from the FDA sort of dashboard where you can report um, issues and, you know, anybody can report issues. So doctors can submit reports. Um, patients can submit reports. So anybody can submit reports, which means, of course, you could th get things that don't make any sense, like people complaining about meiosis, right, right there. So 19 people or so. So, you know, that's a, a patient education issue. Your your pupil will get smaller. Don't complain about that. Um, but if you look at sort of the take home I was going to make, it, you know, the drop came out end of 2021. 2022 was a lot of prescribing and a lot of issues, right? So 2022, a lot of cases and a lot of sort of issues, but this is 2023. And I pulled this um, probably a couple of months ago, but I just checked today and there's maybe 10, 20 more cases in 2023. So the big point is, right, in 2023, hardly, hardly any issues, much, much less issues, right? And that's from a lot of learning, maybe, you know, in the eye care community, maybe less uh, GPs prescribing this, which they probably shouldn't do in the first place. You know, so things are definitely getting better. Patient selection's getting, uh, we're getting better at it. And so things are, are going much better for it. So even though the initial was was kind of crazy, um, it's definitely still a, a useful thing and to try and to look at. One of the things, of course, that people are, you know, concerned about are these, are these retinal issues, right? So retinal attachments, retinal tears. So 4% and 2%, 2%, 3% doesn't seem very high, right? But if you think about sort of the natural history of retinal detachments, uh, you know, the prevalence of those by themselves is is under 0.1%, right? It's something like 0.01% or something. So so definitely 4% is really high. And so that that is worrisome. And so if you look at, you know, the VOD package insert, they definitely have, it's been modified. It used to not say this as much, but you know they do say, yeah, they tell the patients, yes, retinal attachments are have been reported, and with VOD in particular too. Uh, it used to just be it's possible with myotics, right? With pilocarpine back in the days, that was possible, and so that's been adjusted, and so we all have you know definite responsibility to educate our patients about that and warn them of that risk, and make sure we're not putting them at risk, you know, if they have pre-existing retinal issues. So this study, this was the first uh, sort of report of that type of thing that came out um, online in May of 2022. Since then, there's been two or three more. So in this study, or case report series, I should say, um, there were three eyes um, from two patients. And the first patient, um, he complained of, of, of flashes and floaters after just a couple of days. And he ended up right having the retinal detachment, which is denoted by this asterisk, the authors, you know, say it's a little hard to see there. And then retinal tear and, and the infrotemporal and the far periphery over here. Uh, and then the left eye, they also had another retinal attachment and tear, which we don't have a picture of. And so that was definitely, you know, concerning. Uh, the social media, you know, the one that came out was from, from this patient. Uh, he had, you know, no PVD at baseline after taking Vuity, uh, showed up with PVD and, and a large retinal detachment and tear. And so, you know, that was, you know, worrisome to me as a doctor. And, and so I, I definitely slowed down in talking about it. And, uh, and so did patients, I guess. I think eventually the commercials got a little less. Um, so there's me contemplating, you know, with the one sample we have in the office at this point, <laughs> should I put that in? Uh, I have a minus 10 in, in one meridian of my eyes, and then I have uh, some retinal schesis, my, my colleagues tell me. So I'm a little bit concerned for myself there. Uh, and so I've taken a step back and kind of said, huh, why that? Why? Like, why? It's kind of weird. So why are we getting retinal attachments, you know, um, once we sort of release this onto the masses when there were no retinal detachments in the Gemini studies, you know, neither one of them. So, you know, the, the difference uh, really has is that we're using pilocarpine, right, in younger patients when we're treating presbyopia, right? Whereas in glaucoma, when we were looking at you know, even higher percentages, two up to 4%, you know, how come we weren't seeing it quite as much? Well, you know, they already have full PVDs. There's nothing to pull off, you know, for the vitreous to tug on. And so that's one difference. And then the other difference is, is, is in the dosing, right? So 
for glaucoma, you might prescribe pilocarpine back in the day up to four times a day. And so yeah. you're constantly sort of stimulating the ciliary body, right? It's constantly, it's in a state of constant contraction versus treating presbyopia. You put it in it, the ciliary body contracts, tugs on the vitreous a little bit, tugs on the retina, maybe a little bit. And so it, then it relaxes and then you put another drop in and then it tugs again. So it comes down to, you know, would you win a tug of war going, you know, like this, like, you know, back and forth like this, or would you win tug of war, just constant pulling, you know, if you've, if you've really done well at tug of war, you know, that like this really messes up the other side. So, so you can win a, a game of tug of war and sort of pull off your retina better if you've, you know, contract, pull it, let go, contract, pull it. And so that's, another likely reason that we're maybe seeing more retinal issues with this versus, you know, pilocarpine, even at higher concentrations when treating glaucoma. So, so that's definitely something to, to keep in mind. So what comes after Vuity, right? The next one that's coming uh, is, a, is planned or announced by the FDA to be approved. They should hear by the end of this month, actually. It would have been neat if it was approved like right before this talk. Um, so the CSF1, this is 0.4% um, pilocarpine, so not 1.25%. It's lower, lower by like three times, um, but it's supposed to have, you know, similar efficacy. So I'm not sure how that's possible. I'm not really clear. Um, there's no preservatives, right? So VOD is preserved. So like I said, no preservatives is going to be much better for the ocular surface. And they went straight for BID dosing, right? They didn't even try the QID dosing step. Um, straight to BID dosing. And again, the FDA is supposed to announce something on this by the end of the month. So pretty soon, you know, we'll have another drop that's a uh, pilocarpine again, lower dose. And so we would expect maybe less side effects, but I'm not sure, right? If, if it has similar efficacy, it, it might have just as many side effects. I, I don't know. Um, the only thing I've ever heard from a speaker is that, you know, why can they do a third of the concentration and still get good efficacy, it's supposedly because their vehicle somehow is better. Um, but, but I don't know. I, I don't know. We have to see when the full data comes out. But in my mind, if you're able to get equal efficacy, you're probably going to have equal, you know, safety profiles. It can't, I don't see how it could be safer on less dose if it's just as effective. Because again, the beauty people would have, you know, done all the studies, right? They did the dose ranging studies to figure out the best concentration for what they were using. So, well, time will time will tell what what happens with that. One thing to point out is in this study, in the in their trials, right, they're using older patients. So Vuity normally enrolled forty to about fifty five. So in this in these trials, you've got patients, you know, a decade older. So that's good. So they're showing efficacy in even older patients. And other drops we'll look at continue to push that age range, which is which is great. The next one we'll look at, this is a, you know, the micro line device, the Optojet thing that they're looking at for um, delivering multiple types of medications through, but right now looking at one to 2% pilocarpine. And this one, um, I, I, I don't really, you know, understand it per se. Um, they advertise it as like um, an as needed or uh, on demand type of, uh, of drug but I'm not really sure, right? As a presbyo, for me, I would I would love to just put in one drop and be good for the rest of the day and not think about that. Um, you know, and on demand, it, it makes me think of like like Viagra or something. Like, am I, am I gonna have to plan my day out around around when I need to see near? I'm not really sure where the market position is on that. Um, so so that's, uh, take it for what it is. I, I, I'm not sure how you wanna um, do that, but. When Vuity is working, that you know, uh, I, I, for a longer time, it doesn't uh, not necessarily going to be good. In terms of their age range, um, in those two studies, they're kind of looking at similar. They didn't really push the age range like uh, the CSF one, so they did get up to sixty in in one phase three trial, but then back to fifty five in the other phase two. So we'll see what happens with this one. And then the next one um, is Nixol, right? This is 075 percent fentolamine. And they're combining it with pilocarpine. And you probably heard about um, Nixol because just five days ago, uh, it came out, it's now called Resume V. So Resume V for um, reversal of madriasis is just fentolamine by itself. Um, in the studies I've read, the fentolamine by itself, you know, wasn't doing great for presbyopia. And so that's why they're adding the pilocarpine. 
um, to get the better effect. But just by itself, it's working well as a uh, sort of anti-medriasis drop. So that's just coming out. Um, just got approved five days ago. So it's supposed to come out uh, first quarter of 2024 uh, for production and, and purchase. So that'll be interesting. I, and I would imagine the optometry students around here are going to beg for that so they can get back to studying better. <laughs> so we'll see. <laughs> Not preserved, um, just like a lot of the newer ones coming. So QD dosing, that's great. You know, QD dosing, not not uh, they're going to try for a longer duration and not worry about, you know, having to do BID, which is really the future to have a drop that lasts the whole day. So there's a lot of, you know, stuff on these slides. I'm just trying to highlight for you so you don't have to read through everything. They, again, just like CSF1, have pushed sort of the age range, which is great. You know, they view it again at 55. Now they're looking a decade more. So we can use this in older patients with, with more confidence in a sense. So that's great. And then the next one we'll look at is acyclidine by lens. So this is a totally different drop than pilocarpine. So it's quite exciting. Uh, again, really busy slide. Don't try to read it all. Um, they're looking at two versions of this, sort of with and without bromonidine. Um, they call it the 100 for just acyclidine by itself and the 101 um, for bromonidine in addition. Um, their concentration of bromonidine is a secret right now. I asked them directly. It's still a secret right now. <laughs> this, I'm showing you phase two data, um, a little bit older phase two data in this picture, but you can just see it, it's crazy dramatic. The 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 sort of mesopic pupil size of 5.1 getting down to 1.5 millimeters, really small, right below the two millimeters that we looked at with Vuity. And so we'll look at pupil data a little bit more specifically, but just it just crushes the pupil right away and then it, it keeps it there. It's pretty amazing. Um, less myopic shift, supposedly, and so we'll look at data on that, right? Myopic shift caused by, you know, ciliary body stimulation, which, you know, AbbVie spins as, hey, it's a double action for helping you with reading. You're, you've got the meiosis and you've got this myopic shift. Um, but truly, we don't really want that because that's, you know, side effects of that uh, are an issue. And so less myopic shift, we'll talk a little bit more how it kind of does that. And then amazing to me, right? They push the age range again, another decade out, right? So the other drops, CSF1 and, and Nixol, um, you know, went up to 65-ish or 64. Now, you know, acyclidine has patients in their trials in their 70s. Really amazing, right? And then including, uh, you know, post-refractive surgery patients, pseudofakes. So amazing. And then again, their pupil size, once they've got it down, it's holding in there for a very long time, which we'll, we'll compare all three head-to-head -head on another slide. And the next one we'll look at is Brimacol, right? Brimacol is Carbacol and Bromonidine. So Carbacol, I didn't mention it before, Carbacol and Acyclidine both, just like pilocarpine, have been used um, to treat glaucoma before. Uh, Carbacol is actually even stronger than pilocarpine as a meiotic, um, as a cholinergic. Uh, and so, you know, they're not going to... Just knowing that it's stronger, right? You would imagine more side effects possibly. But so obviously they're going to be very careful with the concentration they're using to balance that out. And the bromonidine, actually, uh, they're using 0.1% bromonidine. So they've uh, sort of verified that in, in some sources that I've seen. So they, again, are pushing the age range just like lenses with the cyclidine. So they're getting out in, up to the 80s, which is insane. <laughs> That's amazing. So we can you know go after those higher ad patients. Um, it has a really, really long effect. So just like acyclidine is holding in, this one's holding in quite long as well. Sorry, one second. And then, you know, the bromonidine, supposedly it's kind of helping the carbocol work, um, increasing the bioavailability of carbocol, um, and also kind of actually inhibiting a little bit of that ciliary body contraction that carbocol is causing. And so that's actually an added benefit, right? Some people think it's for, you know, just less hyperemia at the con, but actually has many more um, pharmacological effects, right? And we've heard of bromonidine, bromonidine being used for, you know, treatment of dysphotopsias, glares, and halos, and things like that. And so it does that by inhibiting the dilator muscle. So this one is, you know, going after dilator uh, with bromonidine, which, you know, acyclidine and bromonidine, same thing, but you've got the dilator there and the sphincter. Um, an opposite effect, right? Inhibit the dilator, stimulate the sphincter. So that's probably why, you know, that dual action, you're getting uh, really good sort of pupil effects. 
again, uh, with Carbacol being stronger than Pilo, I, on first glance, right, I would be worried about, you know, more side effects if it's stronger than Pilo, but uh, we'll have to see. So we'll, we'll look at some of the uh, side effect data that's come out. Here's kind of a, a very small dosing study that came out in, in 2019. And as you can see on this right side, um, with 3% Carbacol, you know, they're getting the pupil size under two uh, millimeters, which I'm a little unclear on because the, 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 the y-axis, right, it says mean change in pupil size, but I don't think that's what it is because with less, uh, you know, concentration of Carbacol, you're getting um, a bigger change if that was true. So that doesn't make sense. I, I think, um, you know, they mean to say these are the actual pupil sizes. So I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think so. So I think, you know, that, that amount of Carbacol in this dosing study there, they definitely need to go higher than two and a quarter. And it looks like they're using more like 2.75. So with all that, right, here's sort of a data summary and don't read through all this way too much detail. Here's the highlights, right? Let's just kind of compare efficacy head to head. So if you look at Vuity at three hours, um, you're looking at 31% in the treatment group that reached the outcome measure of three lines or more, 8% in the placebo group. So just kind of, you know, basic sort of multipliers, right? That's about a uh, three times difference, four times difference at the most. Okay, so three to four times difference. If you look at the, the Nixol with the Pilo in addition, um, you're looking at about two times difference when you compare a three hour time mark. And then you look at a uh, lens, they don't have three hour data out, but if you look at 10 hour data, which is crazy, uh, they're at 10 times, you know, 48% versus 4% in the placebo group. So you're looking at 10 times or more in terms of, uh, of efficacy, which is crazy. I mean, two or three versus, you know, two, three, four times versus 10 times. I mean, it's insane. And, and Brimacol doesn't have great data out to look at. So unfortunately, I can't, can't look at it. If we look at the sort of one hour data, so if we look at the, the Nixol with Pilo again, or resume view with Pilo, Pilo however you want to say that now, it's about a two times difference, right? 61% versus about 28%, two times difference. You look at the lens product, uh, again, over 10 times difference. So the efficacy is just stunning. I mean, the difference is, is crazy. Um, the cyclidine is, is way, way uh, hitting the endpoint much more. Uh, and part of it, I mean, if you look at the controls, for some reason, they got really good controls. Like, you know, their, their controls are not getting three lines of improvement. Uh, it's kind of weird how, you know, these controls, almost a third of the placebo groups getting three lines of improvement. Like what happened? I, I'm not sure. So that remains to be seen when we see the full data sets. The other thing to point out, like I've been saying, um, very cool, right? Very neat. Uh, the VOD, you know, they typically went up to 55, but the, the newer drugs being studied, they're going up to 70s and even 80s. So really exciting to treat, you know, more perhaps advanced presbyopes uh, with this. Really amazing. So now I kind of want to do like sort of head to head comparisons on the three meiotics, right? The pilo, the carbocol, and the cyclidine. And just for fun, I'll throw in the fourth one, the fentolamine, um, which doesn't, you know, not working super great. That's why they add it to the add it with pilo. Um, but so we don't know what the combined effects of that are in terms of the data out that I've found. So overall, if you look at these three, they look similar. And I put a I put a plus sign next to the cyclidine because you know the phase the the one of the, they've done multiple phase twos, but one of the phase two data I saw, you know, the the pupil reduction was about closer to 70%, but what they have on their website now is, is closer to 54%. So slightly different phase two trials, slightly different um, pupil size reduction, um, but it, it's it's definitely, you know, 54 or more. So if you look at these three, it's kind of like, huh, maybe they're similar, although again, cyclidine was, is a plus, maybe they're similar. But if we look at sort of the time course, which I think is really important, and sort of the bottom line pupil size, really important. So we're gonna look at one at a time, and then we'll look at all three sort of head to head, right? So here's the Virgo data, right? The Vuity. So you put in the drop at one hour, they do get down to two millimeters of pupil size, okay? Slowly increases. And at about six hours, you put in the second drop of, of Vuity and you get back down to about two millimeters, okay? So you never get below two, so it kind of bottoms out at two millimeters and they are starting sort of in this um, mesopic range here, right? The four to five millimeter people, like we said, and the photopic people around three. So that kind of all makes sense. If we look at the acyclidine, they are 
you know, way down, way down at 1.5 millimeters really just makes the pupil really small. And then the main thing is it really keeps it down there, like really, really down there. And then it starts very slowly going back up and staying there, hanging in for a very long time. Um, one little thing, you know, their pupil size is a little small, right? For, for a mesopic data point, I'm not sure why this is happening, like why it's not more like four. Um, they are using older patients, and so that could be why their pupils are, are naturally a little bit smaller. And so you may say, hey, well, going from 3.5 to 1.5, that's not as dramatic to me. Um, but again, that's it's, it's going to depend on, you know, seeing the full data set. Because in their other phase two uh, that I showed you, you know, they were starting at 5 millimeters and getting down to 1.5. So it's definitely working, even if you have a larger uh, starting pupil size. And then here's the Brimacol data. So here they are getting down again. Um, so they're showing you, you know, carbocol by itself, bromonidine by itself. That was the trial they had to do to show the combined components were, were doing better than individual. So the brimacol, if you look at the lowest one, right, this is the one we want to look at. So it's getting down to about two millimeters, but not not even two or below. And then it's it's you know cranking up there. So comparing, you know, all three, it's really hard to look at those. So what I tell my master's students, you know. Put these on the same scale, right? So that's what I did for you. I sort of measured the y-axis, measured the x-axis, put them on the exact same scale. You can measure it with your finger if you want. <laughs> and so I put the 1.5 millimeter people at the same level, put the four millimeter people at the same level. So now we can like talk about them all at the same time, right? And so if you look again, Vuity gets down to two, Rimacol is getting close to two, but not there. But lens, you know, the the acyclidine definitely getting below two. So it's definitely got, you know, sort of the strongest um, pupil modulation, pupil effect. And again, they're starting at 3.5, which is higher than other people. Um, but with their other phase two data, as far as I can tell, it, you know, it should get down there um, quite well, too. And then the other thing, again, when you get down to two for Vuity, there's a slope increase is decent on here. And if you look at Bremacol, too, the slope is pretty, pretty decent. But this one, acyclidine, is pretty flat, and it's pretty amazing. So it's dramatically different, dramatically different. So if you look at mechanism of action, so, you know, I started researching this, and uh, that definitely went down the rabbit hole and, and trying to remember my PCHEM and pharmacology. Um, but it got really long, and you don't want to see all those slides. So trying to break it down simply, right? These, uh, these drops, they all work on the muscarinic receptors, right? They're all muscarinic cholinergic agonists which means they, they, they bind to acetylcholine receptors. And as far as everything I've read, um, all three meiotics that we're talking about um, are non-selective agonists for all five uh, muscarinic receptors. So I could be wrong. I'm still trying to learn more. Maybe the companies will tell me, but trying to do all my independent research, that's what I've found. The most receptors uh, of, the, of the five types are M3, right? M3, there's you have them in the trochlear meshwork and the cellular muscle as well as iris sphincter, right? And so this is why all three drops have been used in glaucoma because they have effects at the trochlear meshwork to open it up a little bit to reduce the IOP. So really quick on mechanism of action, actually, I won't go through that so much. Um, sorry, one slide I definitely wanted to get to, right? So if you look at uh, induction of uh, uh, accommodated spasm, so pilocarpine in this study from about 50 years ago, about three diopters of myopia induced and cyclidine about a quarter. So really dramatic difference. Um, I haven't been able to find a carbocol um, equivalent study. And then lastly, um, really quick, carbocol again is the strongest meiotic, um, but pilocarpine kind of stimulates the ciliary body the most in terms of ratio. So if you look at acyclidine, you know, they would need a lot more acyclidine to stimulate the steroid body. And so that's likely why, you know, they're not seeing as many headaches. So just super quick, sorry, I'm running out of time. 15%, generally 10 to 15% headaches with pilo. Um, and uh, the Virgo trial showed about 10. And then if we look at Brimacol, they're showing around that to around 10, but more irritation on installation. So that's not so great. And then acyclidine, this is the only slide that has sort of non-public data. This is, I, this is the only way I could get this data to actually ask them. Um, they're showing, you know, just slightly more than 5% headaches. So that would be less than everyone else at this point. And uh, no other side effects that were above 5%, which is sort of the FDA um, cutoff. So in closing, um, you know, ideally, you know, a meiotic would do all this, 
And we're not there yet, but I but in a very short time, you know, we're getting there, which is really amazing. And then lastly, sort of head to head comparisons, you know, for the future, I think we're going towards, you know, once a day dosing, no preservatives, which is great, and then much longer durations, less side effects. And we're able to now, you know, hopefully get into treating even higher as an older patient.